All right, good morning. Welcome back. Um, here is the list of uh, country preferences for the simulation. I thought we were be getting rid of this chair. I'm not going to use this anymore. Well, at least hopefully for the foreseeable years. Um, well, I'm going to go over the list for two purposes. First is to make sure your names are on the sort of correct country preference. And secondly, whenever I read a name here, please stand up so that everybody else in the same group um, sees you and you get to know each other. Some of you already know each other, but some students may not know who is, for instance, Isan, Arab, Samarj, etc. All right? So um, these are determined according to your preferences. And so long as there was a seat available in any country uh, which you chose as your first choice, then I register your name to that particular country. But if there was no seat available, and in most cases, I, I mean, other than the ones available, I register your name to the uh, second, or in some cases, maybe uh, third choice. So, um, and I would like to turn this off. I believe you can keep other members, because I will not be using the screen for a while. I'll be using the board. OK, now uh, I think we can get started. Not only this hour, but also the semester in terms of Middle East security. Uh, because so far last week, both on Tuesday and on Friday, I went through two basic requirements of this course, one of which is writing an op-ed, and the other is, as you have just seen here, representing a number of countries in a simulation session where we will possibly simulate um, an emergency situation in the Middle East, uh, a, a, a meeting convened upon the request of the UN Secretary General from a number of countries uh, which may have concerns with the security situation in the region. Um, I would like to make one point clear, and uh, I, I want to make sure myself. Are the requirements for op-ed writing, in terms of how to determine the topic, as well as, and more importantly, how to write an op-ed as to what it is? I mean, is everything clear? Is there anything that you believe uh, you're, you are not clear, or you may be a little bit confused for some reason? And is there anything that you would like me to repeat here? And so this is important because I want this message to get through, and I don't want to hear any complaints about, well, I was not sure that was what you were expecting from us. Because I think I spent quite a lot of time, and based on my experience, I thought it would be necessary for me to talk at least this much about what an op-ed is. Because in the previous semester, when I asked from students to write an op-ed, I thought I was uh, given enough information, but in due course, I could figure out that uh, not that, uh, that information was not that sufficient, because some students were either on and off listening to what was going on in the class, or not attending the class, or they may not have attended that particular hour that I mentioned. But last time on Tuesday and on, on Friday, I think I devoted quite a significant amount of time to explaining what an op-ed is. Is there anything? Well, just uh, don't be ashamed. You can ask any question because we are students, we are professors. We are supposed to know certain things, and you are supposed to learn certain things. So this is how we proceed throughout the semester. And secondly, uh, are you clear about what is expected from you in terms of simulation? And I think even if there is anything which may not be clear at this moment, or if you encounter any problem in due course, we will be having this sort of a progress report sessions in my office, and I will assign specific time slots, like five, 10 minutes each. I don't want you know, that extended uh, discussion sessions. If need be, of course, we can talk as much as you need. But I would like you to do most of the job yourselves in cooperation with other institutions, like uh, the embassies here or the representative offices. And of course, there will be a certain degree of 
propaganda in the information that will be supplied to you. And this is, after all, quite normal because you will be acting as if you were a member of a delegation that is representing a particular country. So your job will be propaganda anyway. So uh, what I would uh, like to suggest here, please go ahead right after the class, either during the break or after the class, because I think it's lunchtime, so no one should have any class uh, uh, sort of uh, assignment. And please go ahead and just meet each other, I mean, if you don't know already, and sit and talk uh, about sort of uh, what to do, who's going to do what, what I call burden sharing. It's a big assignment, it's a significant uh, assignment. And the more time you devote to it, and the uh, more serious you take it, the better will be the simulation and much more fun you will get out of it. And, and because uh, some students were not present in the previous sessions on uh, Tuesday and Friday last week because some of them were still not registered or in the process of registering themselves to other courses, so they may have missed some of the things that I mentioned here. And please make sure everyone understand, understands what is expected from sort of uh, every uh, groups and, and every group and every student. All right. Um, <clears throat> yes, please. Our pet, uh, for our pets? Well, oh, okay, for simulation, well, I have to think about it a little bit um, because um, I have one major concern. And um, actually, I, I always start trusting people. Even if I'm, you know, hesitant, I just sort of make my choice on the part of students by trusting them. But my major concern is that if I pick the same subject, which is still available, I mean, which is still valid, because what uh, the one that we sort of chose for the last spring semester was, um, uh, you know, there were there were these concerns. Uh, as to whether the United States and or Israel would strike, would carry out a military strike against Iranian facilities and being concerned with this uh, possibility and maybe probability, let's say, um, the UN Secretary General called a co uh, convened an emergency meeting. My concern here is, though this topic is still valid and even maybe more timely because I keep hearing here and there from this and that people who may have access to what is going on in the international arena, that this is something that is even more serious uh, and even more likely, I mean, if there is any likelihood anyway. So if I pick up the same subject, my concern is whether students would like to go uh, through the shortcut and have access to those people who had um, represented some countries in the spring semester and get their notes and without making something new, without adding anything new to that job, would they like to sort of uh, uh, benefit from the previous semester students' work? Well, if, if you think you are not going to talk to anybody who uh, has taken this course before and that your group will do a, a sort of fresh new job for this sort of uh, simulation, I think uh, there is nothing wrong with picking up the same subject. Do you think I should pick that subject? I mean, are you going to talk to your friends, uh, students who have taken this uh, course simulation before? Should I trust you? Say yes or no? <laughs> okay, fine, then the, th the subject is the same. You see, I mean, you start by trusting people, you won't lose. I mean, if you lose, you will still guess, gain something, don't worry about it. And um, so I think, because um, unless the subject is relevant and timely and, of course, valid, um, it may not excite students. Otherwise, if I pick up another subject that may not be uh, of great concern to anybody in the embassies and you may not be given uh, proper information about that, and they may be, they may not be up to the task. So, I think as I will officially, quote unquote, notify you, possibly by Friday we meet here again. Uh, the subject uh, will be most likely uh, pretty much the same. Um, therefore, I think you will be, or you should be, starting to 
finding ways is to have to contact the embassies here and also do what kind of research through the internet and, and other sort of written material from books, journal articles, think tanks, visit the websites of think tanks. Uh, of course, uh, some think tanks may look like serving a very specific purpose, such as propagating a country's sort of uh, idea as well. Uh, this is uh, one of the many sort of uh, um, jobs, let's say, or reasons as to why think tanks are established. So the more um, information that you can get from uh, more or various sources, the better. And you will, of course, uh, be able to... <laughs> God bless you. <laughs> Good. You, you've woken up people who may have been <laughs> sleeping already. Okay, so that's it. Any other questions about op-ed or um, simulation? Because I want to really start with uh, with this the the subject, the course, the, the topic that we will be discussing uh, throughout the semester. And um, for those interested, actually, this book is good for Turkish foreign policy or foreign policy analysis courses. But there are some chapters in this book which is written by myself, by me, and my spouse, who is also a professor Ayşegül at Middle East Technical University International Relations Department. Uh, this is available in the bookstore. Um, for some reason, if you're interested, uh, there are certain subjects, uh, certain parts, uh, which have relevance um, with uh, relevance to this uh, course in terms of Turkey's relations with Middle Eastern countries. But this is not a must book. Actually, none of the books or none of the uh, chapters are must readings, but should readings, <laughs> let's say. Uh, it is highly recommended, recommended that you come to class having read your chapters. Uh, how many of you already checked the, the reserve section of the library? And you made photocopies? And as far as I know, as far as the guy at the reserve section uh, told me these will be available online, uh, e-reserve. There will be an e uh, there's this e-reserve, they scan every pages, but I don't know if about the quality of e-reserve, I mean, scanned pages, if you can read them well. Is it okay? Okay, fine. So long as you understand read. Uh, and please bear in mind, we are not using a textbook here. A textbook is a you know, certain type of book or any course which you follow from number chapter number one till the end and almost chapter by chapter, section by section, paragraph by paragraph. I mean, we are not going to use any textbook. There is nothing uh, very particular to this sort of uh, course in terms of a book, but there will be chapter assignments and some chapters will have some parts which will have relevance to the discussions that we'll be having here in the class. So the readings will make up the background of your understanding, of your knowledge. And I don't want you to sort of be concerned as to whether you should read every single sentence. Of course, the more you read, the more you learn, the better for you. But depending on how many courses you take or how much time you devote uh, to reading and learning, of course, um, it is highly uh, recommended that you make your readings and try to understand the subject because I'm not going to repeat anything or everything uh, that are already in the uh, chapters that are assigned. But these will constitute the background. Without proper understanding this background, Middle East is such a complicated region to really understand well for, for the purpose of this course. And as time you know, as time goes by, as we proceed with the uh, topics that are highlighted in the syllabus, you will understand that lack of information or lack of knowledge about a particular issue will make it more difficult for you to understand other subjects or to properly locate in your sort of a mindset as to what is the relation with this and what is the relation of this with, with the you know, subject that we discuss here. So therefore, uh, I strongly recommend you to come to class with at least having an idea about what we are going to talk about. And uh, as I said, we start
by first of all understanding uh, the subject matter. What is the subject matter of this course? Who could just say? Because what, what are we going to talk about here? Middle East. Do you know what Middle East is all about? I mean, how do you define Middle East? It is always recommended, at least found to be pedagogically uh, correct, to start by defining the subject that you are dealing with. And unless we understand or we, we determine what kind of an understanding we have about the subject at hand, namely Middle East here, I mean, we cannot proceed any further because we should make sure we understand, or at least we understand that we don't understand what or how Middle East is and, and you know, what kind of uh, peculiarities it may have and what are the characteristics of the Middle East. So let's start by uh, hearing from uh, each one of you, I mean, how you see the Middle East? What is it that Middle East uh, uh, means to you? What, what, is, what is Middle East in your view? What, I mean, how would you define Middle East? What are the characteristics of Middle East? Let's like put here characteristics of the Middle East. So what would you say, how would you start with? I mean, what, I mean, and not necessarily in terms of importance, I and mean, in terms of uh, sort of, uh, in, in, sort of, in the, we, we are not going to assign priority to any one of them until we have a complete list, and maybe then looking at the board here from a distance, we may, maybe, and possibly say, okay, here are the most particular or most important characteristics of the Middle East, and here are some other characteristics of the Middle East that will help us uh, here in understanding the, uh, the very sort of uh, uh, characteristics of the region, because this is important. Yes, who would like to, I, I think I saw some, yes, Enes, go ahead. Can you please speak up? Uh, or before being a supplier, you have to have the reserve. So would it be uh, better if we said uh, largest, largest, uh, well, maybe it would not be that correct. Well, Saudi Arabia and Qatar in, in terms of, for instance, uh, oil and natural gas are the largest sort of uh, suppliers as well as have biggest and largest reserves energy resources because of course Central Asia and Russia uh, they should not be forgotten and during the Cold War years because they were not necessarily sort of coming to the fore in terms of uh, political discussions it was all the, you know uh, the, the Soviet Union and uh, most sort of a concern was about the Saudi Arabian or Middle Eastern uh, energy resource in terms of security because Central Asia under the Soviet Union was secure from their perspective. Okay, largest energy resources and what else? There are too many. I mean, trust me, there will be full four sort of uh, boards here about characters. Fatih, go ahead. Boundaries are uh, artificial and boundaries are determined by uh, uh, British Empire and French Empire. Uh, All right, so let's say artificial state boundaries. Well, uh, our Arab neighbors and Middle East neighbors do not like to hear this, but let's put here. Can you read, by the way? This is not a very dark black uh, board marker, but artificial uh, state boundaries. Maybe I should use this one. Go ahead. Yes? Okay, ethnic diversity, uh, or the way you put it, different ethnic group groups. All right, go ahead, Ibrahim. Uh, region between two rivers, one of them, Euphrates, uh, the other is Euphrates and Tigris? Yes. yes, Mesopotamia, you mean? Uh, 
when you speak, please make sure I hear you, okay? If I cannot hear you, and since this being taped, people who are watching this over the internet will not hear anything you say. Okay, um, you point to a particular region within the region, meaning uh, the Euphrates and Tigris River Basin, and what is it that you mention here? Or uh, are you talking about water scarcity or limited amount of water resources or water, uh, a conflict prone resource? Is it, what is it that you just... Uh, Sure, Nile River, Jordan River, the Euphrates, Tigris, Orontes, and others. Uh, all right, so how would you identify in terms of a, being a characteristic? I mean, how would you just make your sentence into something that fits to this format? While well, I think about it, let's hear from Bushra. Go ahead. So let's say it is a cradle of civilizations and the oldest. Uh, my spouse Ashir was in the Gup region, Shal Nurfa, she just, uh, she came yesterday. There was an international uh, workshop, a meeting, and uh, she told me that uh, archaeologists or those who are you know, professional dealing with all this uh, human heritage found something that is as old as 11,500 years kind of plague or a mosaic type of something or tile something. I couldn't uh, really uh, remember specifically. So therefore, it is the cradle of the ancient civilizations were born and spread to the rest of the world. All right. What else? There are too many other things. When I think of Middle East, I cannot even stop my mind. Yes, go ahead. Problem is everywhere, and just what makes it more uh, peculiar to the Middle East is, can we say the uh, never-ending, almost Arab-Israeli conflict? Uh, let's use this port here, and then we'll go. Of course, the Arab-Israeli conflict. And what does this remind us? Um, yeah, political instability, political, economic, uh, as well as uh, and other types of instabilities. Instability is widespread. Instability, and you can apply this to anything as you can uh, think of. Yes, please. Uh, Islamic issues uh, as opposed to Zionism. Maybe it's related to Arab-Israeli Or um, let's the confrontation. Well, this is, the, well, Arab-Israeli conflict is not all about re religion because, I mean, the conflict between Jews and uh, the Arabs were even before the age of Islam. So it goes all the way back to maybe 5,000 5, years. So this is pretty much inherent in the subject. But let's say, um, Monotheist uh, religions, I mean, it's the home of three major religion, right? Home of monotheists, I mean, believe in one God. Christianity, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Yes, makes it. Um, geographically or geostrategic significance is pretty high. And this is something that has to do with the presence of energy resources and also uh, depending on which perspective you look at the issue, of course the presence of Israel and the creation of the State of Israel in May 1948, which of course prompted a number of wars with the Arab countries as we will discuss possibly next hour and in the uh, coming weeks, on Friday and in the coming weeks. 
um, what can we say about this? Um, geostrategic geopolitical significance is for sure based on all this instability everywhere, political instability. What else? There are certain other issues that really, if not peculiar to the Middle East, there are other regions in the world where we can see pretty much the same thing. But when it comes to the Middle East, the degree of significance uh, gets even bigger or more important. Go ahead, Enis. Profitable market for what? <laughs> well, or buying Mercedes and BMWs, Cadillac, uh, yeah, luxury goods. Well, okay. Maybe we can leave this out, out of this, uh, out of the context of Middle East security. It, it is possibly one of the major characteristics. And whenever, even if you get it on a taxi, taxi cab, there is great likelihood that you sort of uh, are in a brand new Mercedes or even a Cadillac when you go to Qatar, United Arab Emirates. These are the countries that I visited in the Gulf region. Yeah, they are rich. Uh, and uh, possibly some brands, some, some cars that you can only see there and also at Bilkent here for the first time in your life. Uh, during last um, Mayfest, uh, I could see from uh, uh, the mirror uh, that there was one red Ferrari and one white Lamborghini coming just right behind me. And they were kind enough to wait until they passed by this radar thing uh, as you go, come up uh, from the main gate here. And when they passed by, I couldn't see them <laughs> anymore. So. Uh, for the first time, you can see some cars, uh, uh, first time uh, h here at Bilkent. And so that makes us no different than Gulf, rich Gulf countries in that sense. All right, Ibrahim, another characteristic? Can, can we count uh, the game table for the spray of power in the world, such as United Yeah, you mean super or uh, extra regional countries intervention or intervention? of uh, extra regional I mean, countries from outside. And of course, especially during the Cold War region, it was the uh, battleground or playground, depending on how you sort of uh, uh, determine these sort of terms. It was a playground of uh, the superpowers. And we, we could see both the Soviet Union and the United States uh, involving in the regional politics and also not only taking sides but also trying to determine the, the pace of events. Yes, what else? Uh, maybe more specifically, Kurdish issue. Kurdish issue is something that we can sort of uh, apply to the entire region. Okay, why, why specifically this? <laughs> okay, not only in Turkey but also in Iraq and Syria, Iran. Well, not so much in Iran, and then not so much in Syria. But okay, uh, Kurdish problem. Let's see. We'll see how it uh, applies. Yes. Is that a, is that a regional problem? Well, it might be, and it it is one of the characteristics of one of it might be one of the. Uh, issues that may have some relevance because the situation in Iraq, as we will see, uh, I mean the security situation, stability, depends heavily on this issue. And actually here I'm putting some issues that may have, not necessarily maybe totally, but may have some relevance to our discussion here. And when we cannot understand Middle East without specifically looking at this issue at, you know, at least to some dimensions of, of this problem and at some length. Of course, it will not constitute the, the entire sort of semester's discussion, but without properly locating as to where it stands with respect to Iraq, with, with respect to Syria, 
with respect to Turkey-Syria and Iraqi relations, which is now part of the Middle East, and also the uh, situation in Iran. Well, okay, let's at least for a while uh, let it stay there, and we'll see how it uh, applies to the purpose of this course. Yes, Chala? Yeah, pre-colonial past, yeah, pre-colonial past. Well, it has to do with uh, maybe the so-called artificial boundaries thing. Uh, the colonial powers have determined the boundaries. And, of course, uh, once boundaries are determined artificially, and, of course, there may be some basis. Uh, the way the colonial powers or great powers at the end of the 19th and at the beginning of 20th century in determining the boundaries, they may have made reference to some points in terms of ethnic religious differences or sectarian differences, not necessarily a religion, but within a religion, sectarian uh, differences may have played a certain role. And great powers of the period, such as the Great Britain, France, of course, since they were there for long periods and they had access to many of the documents, many of the archival stuff, they may have studied the region and they, again, according to what they knew about different sectarian groups, different religious groups, different ethnic groups, they may have divided accordingly in order to set certain groups apart or maybe to mix them so as that there is never a st stability, stable relationship so that they could still uh, uh, you know, play their game by using one against the other. So, therefore, uh, pre-colonial past, especially uh, in Egypt, for instance, you see everywhere the traces of this in their mindset. Being occupied maybe almost throughout their history uh, has left deep traces in their mindset and they made them, uh, this made them uh, quite concerned about the intentions of other countries when they approached them. So, therefore, certain issues, of course, have some uh, uh, impact, bigger impact than others, and pre-colonial past may have had bigger impact on the sort of political relations or relations among nations there or states in the region. Amelia, I saw you hand. Struggle between individual people and their governments, yes. yes. And also like uh, human rights and liberty. Shall, sh shall we say authoritarian regimes or authoritarian slash totalitarian regimes abound because this is important? What is the difference between an authoritarian and totalitarian regime? Who could tell me the difference? They have, of course, some common ground, commonalities, but there is also, at least there are some differences. What do you think? Who could explain to me what is the difference between an authoritarian regime and a totalitarian regime? Can I see new faces? Any volunteers? Okay, Fatih. Uh, the totalitarian regime uh, determines every part of life. Uh, All right. Everything. Uh, authoritarian regime uh, determines some parts. <laughs> well, um, it, it is correct as to what you say about totalitarian regime because, as the name suggests, to total. I mean, it has control, total control on your life. The way you dress, the way you work, the way you sort of you should believe and and politically and also spiritually, etc. But authoritarian uh, it applies a certain degree of authority on you, provided that you do certain things or you do not certain things beyond this or b the boundaries of this. You are kindly or relatively speaking freer, and so you may have some more space, some some privacy and some way of life, provided that you do not uphold against the central authority, 
or you do certain things for them or you do not certain things that may hurt their interest and other than that they may not be interested in how you dress or how you work, how you, how you believe but in totalitarian regime you are of course uh, under control. Can you give names for each a country which has a totalitarian Iran, okay, what about an authoritarian regime, which there are many actually. Well, uh, North Korea in some respect, yes, but uh, it is not 100% totalitarian, which is, I would say, uh, more authoritarian regime. Of course, um, the, the way it looks from outside, it's, it looks like uh, a totalitarian regime, but I would say, at least from my perspective, uh, authoritarian would more or better apply to North Korea. What about an example for a totalitarian regime in the Middle East, since we are talking about Middle East? Come on. You don't have to think for long. All right. What about Syria, for instance? Okay, um, we'll, we'll continue with the major characteristics of the Middle East after a break. And in the meantime, while you buy your coffees, please think about what you're going to say in the second hour. Right. <laughs>